Good evening, everyone. You're very welcome to this episode of Let's Talk Cheap. I'm your host tonight, Kieran Lynch, and our focus for tonight's webinar is on silage production on cheap farms and some of the key management factors that influence both this production and the feed value of that silage. Now, to discuss this in more detail tonight, I'm joined by my colleague from the Research Centre in Chagas at Marie, Dr. Tim Keady. Tim, you're very welcome on. I just get you. Yep, with your camera on. So, Tim, look, we're going to focus on some of the factors that affect production, some factors that affect digestibility, and some other aspects around high quality silage and its role in sheep and indeed beef systems, and different aspects of it too. Um, Tim, I might just get you to start sharing your screen. And just when Tim's getting ready, I'd like to remind our attendees tonight, we try to keep these webinars interactive, so you have the opportunity to ask questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. I'll endeavour to ask them questions of Tim during the webinar and again, we'll have a wrap-up session then. Tim, I think we're going to take a break, maybe just midway through after we look at some of the impacts on production. We'll have a chance to tease out some of the detail. You have quite detailed slides and so we have an opportunity to discuss that a bit more and tease okay. out some of the key issues. So again, just a quick reminder, any of those viewing tonight, you can use that Q&A tab to ask any questions you have of Tim or maybe for more explanation on different points he's going to raise. I'll ask them on behalf and again, we'll have a wrap-up session at the end. So Tim, I'm going to hand over to you at this point and I'll join you in a few moments. So over to you, Tim. Thanks, Kieran. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in the next few weeks, uh, we'll start the biggest annual harvest in Ireland each year, which is that of grass silage. Approximately 25 million tonnes are in silage annually. Tonight, we're going to focus about the production of high feed value grass silage, predominantly for sheep production. But as half of the specialised sheep farms in Ireland have a, a substantial beef enterprise, we will also mention a small bit about beef cattle. From data that we collated a number of years ago, grass silage was found, to, grass silage feed value was found to be the third most important factor affecting profitability. And you may ask why? Well, it will have an impact on new body condition score, lamb birth weight, colostrum quantity and quality, and lamb survivability. And if you get these three, three, three things right, it will also reduce labour during the most labour intensive time of the year on a sheep farm, which is lambing. Grass silage is a basal forage on most farms in Ireland with ruminant livestock during the winter feeding period. It is a valuable commodity, particularly when you go short, and it's very difficult to source high feed value silage, and one way around it is to produce it yourself. For I firmly believe that the production of grass silage is a key task on the farm manually. It takes one or two days to produce it, but you will reap the rewards uh, during the following winter daily for four or five months when you're feeding it out. Tonight, we're going to focus on feed value. And feed value is a combination of nutritive value, namely digestibility or energy concentration and intake potential. And digestibility or, dry, or DMD impacts both nutritive value and intake potential, and we'll focus quite a bit on that this evening. I've just presented here a slide for the mean analysis of the silages produced in Ireland in 2020, and we won't spend too long on it, but the average silage has a dry matter digestibility of about 68.5%. It has a crude protein of 11.8, and if you fed it to a growing cattle 500 kilograms, they'd consume about eight kilos, and gain about 0.6 of a kilo. But you all know the average holds or hides a lot of the truth. And for example, if I was to take the host here tonight and put one of his feet in a burning fire and the other one in a bucket of liquid nitrogen and adjust him around a small bit, we'll get his average temperature about right, but he'd be very uncomfortable indeed. Similarly, when you're talking about silage analysis, you can see the digestibility can vary from a low of 52% to a high of 82%, basically going from glorified straw up to nearly good quality grazing swords. And this shows that such a wide range in silage digestibility has a big effect on potential intake. And if you're to feed it to, we'll say, a growing bullock or steer, it will have basically a very live weight gain from a zero up to 1.1. I think this slide clearly indicates that when you're forming a nutritional program next year for your animals, it's vitally important that you know the feed value of the silage that's on your farm 
and not the average for the country or what's on anyone else's farm. Because we're talking about sheep production tonight, a key factor that affects lamb performance is actually lamb birth weight. And lamb birth weight is highly influenced by what happens during nutrition during mid and late pregnancy. Our data from Matt and Rye shows that each 0.5 of a kilo increase in lamb birth weight will increase the weight of weaning by about 1.7 kilos. Or another way of looking at it is that these lambs will be approximately two weeks younger at the point of slaughter. Another way of looking at this is that at the beginning of March, if you were to lodge 100 euros into your local bank and come back in early June, 100 days later, they'd give you back 320 euros. That's the rate of response that you're getting from increasing lamb birth weight. Other things that are happening during late pregnancy is there's a big increase in energy requirements and protein requirements of the ewe. And this has to be met either from the forage component or high levels of concentrate feeding. This slide here shows the impact of the effect of lamb birth weight on lamb survivability or lamb mortality. If we just look at the blue line, this is the effect of birth weight on lamb mortality of lambs who are born as twins. And as you can see, at light birth weights of around three, two and a half to three and a half kilos, lamb mortality can be high. As birth weight increases, lamb mortality decreases until it comes to an optimum. And as lambs get heavier again, lamb mortality increases, probably due to dystocia. Our data would show that the optimum birth weight for lambs born as singles, twins, and triplets is about six kilos, 5.6, and 4.7, respectively. So tonight, Chairman, I would like to talk about the production of high quality silage under the following headings. Digestibility, how important is it? Its effect on animal performance, and what factor is affected when you're producing, uh, producing it in the field? We'll mention a bit on grass production, looking at nitrogen and potassium fertilizer application. We'll talk about Wilton, the impact of chop lint, and we'll have a summary slide at the end about silage additives. So let's talk about digestibility. As far as I'm concerned, digestibility is king in the production of silage for pregnant Jews, finishing lambs, or finishing beef cattle. And you may ask, how do you assess it? Well, there's two ways of assessing the impact of digestibility on animal performance, and I've taken an example of beef cattle here. There are three silages, good quality silage, an average quality silage, and a poor quality silage. And we could ask ourselves the question, if these silages were fed as the sole forage to these cattle, what would the level of daily live weight gain be? And you can see, those on the good silage would gain 0.97 of a kilo, those on the average 0.5 of a kilo, and those on the poor quality silage 0.2 of a kilo. Or you could say, what is the impact of silage digestibility on the level of concentrate required to get a given level of animal performance? And if our target is one kilo of live weight gain, the good silage will require 0.5 kilos of supplementation. The average 4.7 kilos of supplementation and the poor quality silage will require 6.5 kilos of supplementation per head per day just to give you the same levels of animal performance. I'm presenting here a slide looking at the quality of two silages from a study, 68 and 78 DMD, each supplemented with different levels of concentrate going from 2.2 up to 7.3 kilos per bullock per day. And what I've presented here is the total carcass weight that these animals will gain over a standard 150 day finishing period. As you can see, regardless of concentrate supplementation, as you increase silage digestibility, you will increase carcass weight gained over the period by 44 kilos at the low level of concentrate, the same at the medium level of concentrate, and 20 kilos at the high level of concentrate because grass silage forms a smaller proportion of the diet. But at today's price, 20 kilos is worth the guts of 90 euros. The second thing to note is that with average quality silage, as you increase concentrate feed level, 
you get a linear response in the amount of animal performance that's achieved, even up to seven and a half kilos of concentrate. With the high quality silage, going from 2.2 to 4.7, you got an increase of 16 kilos of carcass weight. But supplementing with concentrate above that did not increase animal performance. And basically what was happening was the animals consumed the concentrate, they ate less silage because this concentrate was replacing silage in the diet. Or another way of looking at it is that high quality silage with 2.2 kilos of concentrate gave you similar levels of carcass weight gain over the period as average quality silage with 7.3 kilos of concentrate. In other words, the same level of concent the same level of performance for 750 kilos less concentrate during a 150 day finishing period. So let's move on to sheep. What is the impact of digestibility in sheep during mid and late pregnancy? This slide here is a culmination of a number of studies that we undertook here at Atten Rye. And in these studies, the ewes were housed in the middle of December, put onto the different qualities of grass silage and lambed from early to mid-March. The average quality silage in these studies averaged over the studies was 71% DMD. The high quality silage was 77% DMD. What was the impact? The high quality silage, the yews that consumed it, were eight kilos heavier at the, at the point of lambing. The lambs were 0.35 kilos heavier at the point of birth. And the lambs at weaning were 1.2 kilos heavier. The data shows that each five percentage unit increase in dry matter digestibility increases lamb birth weight by 0.25 kilos, increases ewe weight by, by 6.5 kilos. And these increases in performance is due to an increase in silage intake of 0.25 kilos. And whilst you get an increase in silage intake, you get a bigger increase in energy intake because digestibility affects both the energy concentration of the forage as well as, as, well as its intake characteristics. So let's look at another study that we published recently where we had two qualities of grass silage with an average of 70% DMD and with a high quality silage of 79. In this study, we fed the same level of concentrate of 20 kilos during late pregnancy. At the, in, at the point of lambing, the ewes and the high quality silage were 10 kilos heavier. Their lambs were 0.5 kilos heavier at birth and they were two kilos heavier at the point of weaning. So what's going on? These animals consumed more silage per day. They had a higher intake of nutrients, including protein and energy. Because they were heavier, they were also had better body condition score. And when they were turned out to pasture post lambing, they were able to mobilize some of the body condition from their back and produce milk so that these lambs could grow faster. On the other hand, these guys that were averaged, that were offered the average quality silage, partitioned their energy when they went to pasture to actually put in on body condition rather than producing milk. And as you can see, their lambs were lighter at the point of weaning by approximately two kilos. And another way of looking at this difference in lamb weaning weight is that if you want to increase lamb weaning weight by two kilos, you would require to be feed every lamb 19 kilos of creep concentrate between uh, turnout to pasture and prior to weaning. Another way of looking at the impact of silage digestibility or feed value on animal performance is to ask yourself the question, by how much can I reduce concentrate feed level and still maintain performance? In this study, we offered a high quality silage supplemented in the last three weeks prior to lambing with a total of five kilos of mineralized concentrate. The yews were nine kilos heavier at, at lambing because they'd been on the high quality silage since prior to Christmas. Their lambs were 0.3 of a kilo heavier at birth and they were still a kilo heavier at weaning than the average quality silage supplemented with 20 kilos of concentrate. So this shows us that the high DMD silage reduced uh, concentrate requirement by up to 
and also it reduced the age of slaughter by up to 17 days or two and a half weeks. In other studies, we've looked at the effect of silage digestibility and level of concentrate offered to use and their impact on lamb birth weight. In this study, we had 74 DMD silage and the average silage of 69. And remember that the average silage produced in Ireland today is about 68.5 to 69% DMD. And some people who produce 70% DMD silage think they produce a very good silage. It's average. On the high quality silage, we fed either 5, 15, or 25 kilos of concentrate during the last six weeks of pregnancy. And as you can see, increase in concentrate feed level from 5 to 15 resulted in an improvement in lamb birth weight, but there was no difference thereafter from putting in an extra 10 kilos of ration. And the reason for that was that the high quality silage had a high substitution effect. In other words, each kilo of concentrates that the ewes consumed, they consumed about 0.75 kilos less of silage dry matter. With the average quality of silage, we supplemented with 15, 25, 35, or 45 kilos of concentrate during late pregnancy. And as you can see, as you increase concentrate feed level from 15 to 25 kilos, you got a good increase in lamb birth weight. Going from 25 to 35, a small improvement in lamb birth weight and no beneficial effect thereafter. So you may ask what was happening. The extra concentrate that the yews were consuming were actually going into body condition score rather than into lamb birth weight, which is a critical, which is a critical factor when you're producing lamb for mid-season prime lamb production. So Chairman, I've summarized here the level of concentrate required as in, in late pregnancy, as impacted by silage quality, as determined by dry matter digestibility, and also by chop length. And we'll talk about chop length later in the presentation. But as you can see, as digestibility declines from 79 to 60, the amount of concentrate required in late pregnancy goes from eight up to 35 kilos. As you increase chop length, the amount of concentrate also increases such that if you go from a precision chop, high DMD silage, down to a low DMD silage, big uh, single chop silage, you need to increase concentrate quite dramatically from about eight up to 40 kilos of concentrate during the final six to eight weeks of pregnancy. So let's summarize silage digestibility and its importance. Our data clearly shows that each five percentage unit increase in silage digestibility improves ewe weight post lambing by six and a half kilos. Lamb weight at birth by, two, by 0.25 of a kilo. At weaning by approximately one kilo. If you're finishing lambs, it increases carcass gain by 41 grams per lamb per day. If you're finishing cattle, it increases carcass weight by about 20, 20 kilos during a standard 150 day finishing period. So based on our results, we've set a target of 75% DMD, particularly for use in mid to late pregnancy and also for other animals that have to perform on your farm. Now, we've talked a bit about producing high quality silage. That's only half of the equation. We won't go into any more detail about it this evening, but there's no point in having super silage in a bale or in a clamp if the animals don't consume it. And this is an example of a photograph I took in the shed one morning where you can see that the sheep have cleaned the concrete. On paper, the silage is super, but if they don't have access to it, it's not much better than average quality silage. Point well made, Tim. Look, we'll give you a quick minute there just to catch your breath. I must remember to stay away from you if you see you coming towards me with two buckets. It could be quite uncomfortable. Uh, look, just when Tim's catching his breath, I'd like to remind those attending tonight, he can ask you questions via the Q&A tab. I'll endeavour to ask them on your behalf. Tim, maybe just to start you off for a point of clarity and some of the data he shows, Cecil had a question about age at weaning. I'm assuming that's 14 weeks in those studies you're talking about. Yes. Okay. Look, I've discussed this with you before. If we look at the average, and it hasn't changed much over the last number of years, there's clearly great scope there to improve silage quality. What do you think is limited? Is it a quality versus quantity issue on farms, you know, why aren't we trying to up the game for silage production? 
Oh, who could be here all night trying to answer that, Kieran? Uh, we do. We've set a target there, seventy-five percent. But I suppose a more realistic target for most producers is try and lift it by five. So if you're producing sixty-five DMD, let's go to seventy. Uh, the big issue is that people are trying are kind of going for quantity, and they should be looking at quality. And it also depends on your system of production. Some people believe that if they may also have suckler cows in the farm where they're feeding out of the same clamp or the same stack of bales. I believe that if people are producing big bale silage, then there's greater opportunity to produce high quality silage because they can afford to, to harvest a lighter crop more frequently. Because when you're paying the contractor, you're paying by the number of bales and you're not paying by the acre. Also, if you're harvesting more frequently, you can apply a, lesser, a slightly lesser amount of fertilizer, and we'll talk about that later on, where it's being harvested after six, a five to six or seven week interval, rather than where you're harvesting it after eight, nine or 10 week interval. So I think we need to focus on that. Also, some people believe that they want to get a, a wait for, sometimes if the weather's slightly broken, they might try and wait for, for a few good sunny days to wilt, or people are waiting until the nitrogen is utilized out of the grass. And people sometimes wait too long for the nitrogen to be utilized out of the grass. And we can talk about that later on, because once you're gone past five or six weeks regrowth, uh, then you should be able to ensile it without any difficulty, particularly if you are going to wilt it, because wilting fr from about 18 percent dry matter in a standing crop up to 25 to 30 percent will make it extreme, will make it reasonable and easy to ensile material at that stage. No, I think your point about the big bales, I suppose the key thing there, Tim, is to identify that high quality silage and target feeding it. Just speaking about target and feeding it, like, look, we focus a lot on late pregnancy. Is the potential, particularly for flocks, maybe to struggle with condition or you want to improve the performance, to maybe put a bit more effort in the mid-pregnancy feeding? And just to maybe add one on to that, like, how much of this should we be targeting after high quality silage to make for you during a typical, we say, 100-day winter? Well, my target is to make high quality silage from the day she enters the shed until the day she exits the shed. So that's for the whole period. You ask um, how much silage is required. Uh, in some of our studies with high quality silage, we'd get an intake of about 1.2, 1.3 kilos of silage dry matter per head per day. So if that's for easy sake, if it's 25% dry matter silage, you need five kilos of fresh silage per year per day. So that over a hundred day period, that is a, five, is a half a tonne of fresh silage to be available to the yaw when she's in this shed to consume it. If you're making poor quality silage, no matter how much you put in front of them, they won't eat it. So their, their consumption could be down at 0.7 or 0.8. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's about three and a half or four kilos of silage, fresh silage you'd require per head per day if it's 25% dry matter at the point of feeding out. Okay, uh, you asked you a question, I think as well, that you need to have high quality silage going the whole way through from housing till the time of blaming. And our data would show that the response to silage digestibility on forage intake and consequently nutrient intake is the same whether the yaw is in mid-pregnancy or during the final six weeks of pregnancy. I know that there was a perception possibly in the past that you could let yaws lose body condition, but I don't think I'd be recommending that to anyone. I, my objective is always to try and maintain body condition from the day they go into the shed until the day they go out. And if we looked at them last studies that I talked about there, the data with the high quality silage during the last six weeks of pregnancy, them yaws were actually gaining body condition of 0.1 to 0.15 body unit, units of body condition score. Whereas the guys on the average quality silage, and remember, the average quality silage in them studies was 72% DMD, whereas some people would call that good silage, were actually losing 0.35 of a unit of condition score. So the difference between them in the last six to seven weeks was a half a unit different body condition score. And that's equivalent to about six kilos of body weight. And can you imagine? When you go out, put them sheep out to grass and you're grazing tight, trying to get good levels of lamb performance and your performance from grazed grass, you can do it a lot more easier with yaws that have some energy on their back that they can, uh, that they can partition the energy into milk rather than into gaining body condition. And the stark mm -hmm. reality that came out of them studies was that when the yaws of moderate condition went to grass, they weren't too bothered about milk. They were partitioning the energy into replenishing body condition score Whereas that wasn't our objective, but that was the yours objective and we'd no control over it. And I think, Tim, like you've alluded to it there, that's probably one of the hidden costs and systems that they don't see. It's that effect it has on performance. We could argue it has an effect on labour with a reduction in lamb mortality in other ways. And obviously there's a concentrate saving. So it has a big effect. Look, I have a question in here from Sam. Um, it's more a breed question, even a mature way to you. Can that have a big impact on how much silage is consumed during that period? 
Oh, of course it can, yeah. Uh, the heavier you also will always consume more silage, but in our comparisons, each treatment would have the same breed of yo and the same body weight to eliminate them effects, but weight would have a big effect on how much they'll actually consume. I'm conscious you have quite a lot to go through, but just the final point of clarity, just a question from James about body condition score. I'm assuming you measured that in quarter units for those studies yeah. you alluded to. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Look, Tim, I think you have a favourite to go through. We'll have an opportunity to come back at the end and maybe come back on some of these points or maybe there'll be other bits that'll be raised. Um, look, if we move on to maybe the production of and some of them factors that influence suggestibility, I'll let you continue on and I'll join you again at the end. So look, just before I hand back to you, I'd like to encourage everybody again, use that Q&A tab if you have any questions for Tim on aspects he raises. So Tim, I'll throw it back over to you. Thanks, Kieran. So we'll move on now and we'll talk about what are the factors that affect silage digestibility. Most of the factors that affect silage digestibility can be uh, controlled by the producer. The first and the most important factor that affects digesti digestibility is the date of harvest. And I've taken an example here of a study with first cut silage, but it doesn't matter whether we're talking about first cut or second cut, and I'll explain to you in the next slide why. Our data showed that where we, where we sampled the silage at weekly intervals, we got a linear decline in digestibility such that digestibility or DMD dropped by about 3.3 percentage units for each one de week delay in harvest. And that's a, that's, a big, that's a big factor. So when you're getting a drop in digestibility, you're getting a drop in intake characteristics, you're getting a drop in the energy content of the forage and subsequently in nutrient intake. So this slide here lists the factors affecting silage digestibility. The first one, date of harvest, as I alluded to already. Each week, delay in harvest, digestibility drops by 3.3 percentage units. You get the same rate of decline in digestibility, whether you're talking about the primary growth or the first cut or the second cut. So if you decide as a producer that you're going to delay harvest by one week, you'll take a hit in digestibility of a little over 3 percentage units. What does that mean? Well, to maintain performance, if you're finishing beef cattle, you require 1.2 kilos of concentrate per animal per day during the finishing period. And for you in late pregnancy, if you want to maintain lamb birth weight, she will require 10 kilos of additional concentrate during the last six weeks of pregnancy to try and maintain lamb birth weight. The second factor that affects digestibility is crop lodging. Lodging accelerates the rate of decline in digestibility. And the reason for this is when the crop falls over, sunlight can't get into the base of the plant, you get the accumulation of uh, dead material or synthesis of material. We all know that green leaf has a higher digestibility than de de decaying or dead material. And this causes an, an accelerate the decline in digestibility. In severely large crop situations, digestibility may decline by up to nine percentage units per week, but that's in a severe case. In most, most crops, it could decline by four to five to six units. And in a large crop situation, your objective is to try and get it out as soon as you can. Silage fermentation. If you have an untreated silage that's poorly fermented, the fermentation will reduce digestibility by about three to four percentage units, depending on how bad your fermentation is. Our data would show that increasing nitrogen fertilizer can cause a small reduction in digestibility simply because it's producing a heavier sward canopy. And if you're getting a heavier sward canopy, uh, you'll get more senescence at the base of the crop and that will reduce digestibility. And wilting, and we'll discuss, discuss this in more detail later on, can cause a decline in digestibility. And in severe cases, you could lose one to two percentage units per 24 hour period. And this becomes critical if you're intending to leave the sward line, the herbage line on the ground for three or four days prior to bringing it in. Or if you haven't the tethers are set at the right height, and you're raking up some soil contamination. It is generally perceived that herbage from old permanent pastures can't make good quality silage compared to perennial ryegrass swards. There are a quite a number of studies that would state that this statement is incorrect. And one of these studies here compared herbage from an old permanent pasture and perennial ryegrass sward harvested as a third cut silage. As you can see, the silages have a similar fermentation as measured by pH and ammonia nitrogen, they had similar feed value as measured by dry matter digestibility, they had similar intake as, me as measured with growing beef cattle. So this shows 
that high feed value silage can be produced from all permanent pastures. Perennial ryegrass, ward, uh, perennial ryegrass grass varieties are classified based on heading date. The general old rule of thumb was that the optimum stage to harvest the sward for silage was at 50% year emergence. This is a study that was undertaken over two years that compared intermediate heading varieties with late heading varieties. 50% year emergence occurred in the intermediate heading varieties on the, 20 to, on the 19th of May and three weeks later on the late heading varieties. And when these silages were harvested at 50% year emergence, the DMD of the intermediate varieties on the 20th of May was 77%. And on the 13th of June in the late heading varieties, it was 71%. But this study showed that if the swords were closed at the same time, to get silage with the same digestibility, herbage from the later heading maturity would have to be harvested about eight to nine days later than those from the intermediate heading varieties to get the same level of dry matter digestibility and the same performance whether you're feeding it to yos in, during pregnancy or finishing cattle. So what this slide is telling us is you do not base harvest date on heading date alone. I'll give you an example of why. This is an example of a sward that, was, uh, that we examined and you can see there's very little seed head emergence in this. This was for a second cut. If we just looked over the gate and said, we'd said, oh, we'll leave it another week because there's no seed head emergence. But look, we pulled, we went into the sward, we pulled it, teased it out, we pulled it back. And at the base of the sward here, you could see the accumulation of dead material. They were senescent, they were dying. Uh, it was accumulating. So that meant digestibility was declining. So what this slide shows us is that when you're making a decision of when to harvest a sward, you should base your decision on what occurs on the top of the canopy in terms of seed heads, but equally or more important, what is occurring at the bottom of the canopy so you won't be getting a big accumulation of dead material coming into the sward. So talk about tearing to practice. The data shows each five units increase in digestibility increases lamb birth weight and the weight of the youth lambing by six and a half kilos. Digestibility is king, target 75% DMD. It has a big effect on profitability because it affects animal performance from grass silage. Target for first cut if you can is harvest in mid-May. Regrowths, harvest them at six to seven week regrowth intervals, assuming that you're getting a six week regrowth period and that you haven't hit a drought for two or three weeks in this period of time. More to a stubble height of about five centimeters. Sward type, all permanent pasture uh, can produce the same level uh, high feed value grass silage similar to perennial ryegrass swards. Heading date of perennial ryegrass sward also impacts on the optimum time to harvest the grass. Base your harvest date on inspection of the sward canopy and not just on heading date alone. The next area I'd like to talk about is a production as grass production and we're going to cover nitrogen and potassium fertilizer here. To achieve the maximum response to fertilizer nitrogen, soil P or phosphorus, potassium and pH need to be at the optimum levels. The question we're often asked is, what is the response kilos of herbage dry matter per kilo of nitrogen applied? And I've taken three studies here at random. And the response that you get from applying nitrogen depends on the prevailing weather, the sward type, the regrowth interval, but also how much nitrogen that you're actually applying. So in this study, when they went from 100 kilos per hectare to 150, or that's about, about 80 units to 120, the response was 10 kilos of herbage dry matter per kilo of nitrogen. In this study, going from 100 units to 140, they got a response of 5.2. And in this study, going from about 60 units up to about 140 units, they got a response of eight kilos of dry matter per kilo of nitrogen. And as I said, the response depends on prevailing weather condition, swar type, and regrowth interval. Level of nitrogen fertilizer also affects herbage composition. In this study, as you increase the level of nitrogen fertilizer applied, you had a positive effect on herbage crude protein concentration. The two main factors that affects herbage crude protein 
is how leafy the sward is at the point of ensiling or stage of maturity. And secondly, level of fertilizer or nitrogen application. From an ensilability point of view, you'll also have an effect on the sugar concentration and the sugar concentrations will decline as the level of nitrogen uh, goes up and the uh, level of nitrogen application increases. Potassium is often an under, underlooked uh, nutrient in terms of silage production. Here is a study where we looked at the herbage response to applying different levels of potassium nitrogen fertilizer to a soil that had an index of three. As you can see, as you increase potassium fertilizer application, you got an increase in herbage dry matter production from 6.3 up to 6.9 tons of dry matter in the first cut. We also looked at the carryover effect and we got an increase in the second cut from 2.6 to 2.9 tons of dry matter per hectare. Averaged over the two responses or the two harvests, our response was per kilo of, of to potassium was 4.5 kilos of herbage dry matter per kilo of potassium. In other words, we were nearly getting the same response to the potassium here in this study as it was got from nitrogen in previous studies. Each ton of herbage, each ton of herbage dry matter, that's five tons of fresh herbage, will remove 25 kilos of, of, of potassium equivalent to approximately a bag of muriate potash. And we found that excess potassium had no negative effect on herbage uh, composition and no negative effect on silage feed value. Theory into practice. When you're closing the sward, try and have it grazed to the uh, very tight, grazed tight to about four centimeters. For a first cut, apply about 100 to 120 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare for the first harvest, that's 90 to 100 units per acre. For the second cut, at 90 to 100 kilograms per hectare, that's 70 to 80 units per acre. Uh, if you're cutting first cut, so, uh, some people talk about splitting it. I can't find any evidence to show a benefit on yield to splitting, but there are benefits from management and the environmental point of view. From a management point of view, if you're applying nitrogen in February or March, busy time of the year, if you're only putting on half the nitrogen, you can cover more ground in a given period of time and come back and put on the second split in late March or early April and still have no negative effect on your harvest date. If you've previously grazed the ground, assume that 20 to 30% of the nitrogen applied for the last grazing is still available. If you have a prized slurry, particularly for first cut silage, make an allowance of five to 10 units of equivalent of five to 10 units of nitrogen per thousand gallons of slurry applied. When you're applying P and K, maintain soil fertility. Potassium has a big pack impact on herbage yield. And remember that each ton of herbage dry matter, or that's about five tons of fresh herbage, removes about 25 kilos of potassium uh, from, your swar from your pasture that needs to be replenished for the next, next, next harvest. The next area I'd like to talk about, Kieran, is Wilton. Uh, when you're talking about Wilton, a rapid wilt is, very, is, 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 is essential. And the reason I say that is because wilting can have a negative in, impact on um, negative impact on 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 uh, di dry matter digestibility. Uh, some people will mow out swords, leave them for a day or two, will not tear them out, and still think they're wilting the silage. But that may not be as beneficial as they may have thought initially. The three factors that affect the rate of water loss from uh, herbage is solar radiation or sunshine. The weight per unit area, in other words, they just cover the, as much ground as possible with the herbage, spread it out, and thirdly is wind speed. This is an example of a study where they looked at three different treatments to, and, and its effect on the drying or wilting of grass. The yield of this sward prior to cutting was 12 tonnes per acre or 29 tonnes per hectare. The treatments they had was they auto swarted two tin foots on top of each other, left a single tin foot on its own, or they tethered it out immediately after mowing. The grass was mowed at 16% dry matter. After 24 hours, the auto swart had only increased by 3%. The dry matter in the single sward was gone up by 7%. And the dry matter uh, in the material that was spread out was gone up to 30% after 24 hours. After 48 hours, in the auto swart material, the dry matter was only gone up to 23%. The single swart was gone up to 32%, and when it was spread out, it was gone up to 50%. This shows that spreading out accelerates the rate of wilting and the rate of water loss. But 
when you tear it out because of a rapid drying rate, you need to have the harvester ready to move in so that instead of so that you don't run into the problem of ensiling very dry matter, very high dry matter material, particularly if going into a clamp. Another way of looking at this, based on the results of this study, if your objective was to have the herbage at 25% dry matter, then if you left it all swarted, it took 65 hours. If you single it, if you had left it in a single swart, it took 30 hours. And if you tethered it out, it only took 14 hours to get the same level of dry matter. And if you think back to something earlier where I said, if you leave it for 65 hours, you're going to lose about four or five units in digestibility, whereas you're bringing it in after 14 hours, provided machinery is well set and there's no soil contamination, you have little or no negative effect on silage dry matter digestibility. Looking at the effect of rapid wilting on animal performance, and this is the mean of 11 studies and apologies for using dairy cows. The facts is that when the herbage was wilted, in this study, it was inside at 16% dry matter. The wilted herbage went up to 32% dry matter. Wilting increased forage intake by 17%. And for that, it had a small improvement in milk yield and milk solid output, such that milk solid output was increased by 6%. A combination of increased intake and a small benefit in animal performance resulted in a reduction in milk output per hectare of ground that was ensiled. People often ask that if the herbage is ready for ensiling at 19%, what happens if you're kind of working in broken weather and it's going to last for a long time? In this study, we ensiled grass at 19%. It was well preserved. The intake was okay, this was with cows again, and gave us a milk yield of 20 kilos. We wilted it up to 28%, the, the intake went up, the preservation was the same, and the animal performance was the same. Sometimes you can get a period of uh, damp weather, and in this situation, we bought the dry matter content of the grass down to about 14% at the point of ensiling. But at the point of feed out, these silages had similar dry matter because of loss of effluent. And as you can see, there was no difference in intake or animal performance with dairy cows. I suppose the objective would be if the weather, if there's some dry weather promised in the near future, you may consider delaying two or three days to wilt. But if there's no good weather promised for a, a week or two, then you'd have to seriously consider looking at this option. And the conclusion is if herbage is ready in dry weather, it's also ready in damp conditions. So, theory into practice Wilton reduces effluent, it can reduce dry matter digestibility, it reduces animal output per hectare because of an increase in forage intake for a small benefit in animal performance if you get it. If you're going to wilt, you want a rapid wilt, so spread it out immediately post morn In sile after 24 to 36 hours, do not delay harvest date for a prolonged period of time with the hope of getting a good wilt, And if herbage is ready in dry weather, it's also ready in damp conditions. The second last subject I'd like to talk about, Kieran, is uh, chop lint. Uh, we know with beef and dairy cattle that chop lint has little or no effect on forage intake or animal performance in beef and dairy cattle. However, it may be a different story with sheep. This is the results of a study that was undertaken which compared, which looked at chopped lint and to do this they either precision chopped it or they single chopped it and uh, they came in at the same dry matter uh, herbage coming from the same swords. The oats in late pregnancy got 18 or 6 kilos of concentrate and to cut a long story short precision chopping increased forage dry matter intake compared to single chopping and that was due to chopped lint per se and because of the higher intake these uh, gained or had a higher body, had, had a smaller body weight change, whereas the ones on single chop lost more body weight. And these, the ones on preci precision chop, reduced lambs with heavier birth weight relative to the doors on single chop, simply because they had a higher intake. Or another way of looking ahead was that the precision chop silage, because of its higher intake, uh, you could reduce concentrate feed level and get the same level of long chop silage uh, with, uh, with three times more concentrate supplementation. The last area, Kieran, I'd like to talk about this evening is silage additives. Traditionally, 
when producers use silage additive, their main aim was to use an additive to improve fermentation under difficult in siling conditions. And traditionally, in them kind of conditions, you would have either used sugar or molasses and an acid, an acid based product to improve fermentation. I firmly believe that animal performance is the most important selection criteria to use if you decide to spend money in an additive. From a review of 95 studies where different additives were compared to untreated silages, it can be concluded that the use of additives such as molasses, sulfuric acid, enzymes, or bee pulp uh, will, did not improve, from, would improve fermentation, but they had no effect on animal performance. Across a wide range of conditions, the use of an effective inoculant and formic acid under difficult conditions uh, increased performance uh, uh, and gave a return on investment. Therefore, I wish to conclude. Silage feed value is the third most important factor affecting the profitability in prime lamb production in mid-season flocks. For yews in mid and late pregnancy, uh, they may, we should target a silage with a digestibility of 75% DMD. In producing silage, digestibility is king. That's what you're going for. And the reason why, each five units increase in digestibility, increases lamb birth weight by 0.25 of a kilo, increases weaning weight by approximately one kilo, reduces the age of slaughter of the lambs by between seven and 10 days. And if you're in beef production, it increases carcass gain by about 21 kilos. Wilton reduces effluent and animal output per hectare. And if you are Wilton, a rapid wilt is essential. Choplint affects intake by sheep. And if, if you're considering silage additives, base it on its ability, proven ability to increase lamb per, animal performance. So to summarize, your main aim is to produce a silage that supports high levels of, la, of animal performance. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Very comprehensive overview of different factors involved in it. Um, just when Tim catches his breath, I'd like to remind our attendees, if you have any questions for Tim on any of the points he's raised, you can use that Q&A tab and we still have time to get around a few of them. Tim, maybe we just start off like, look, one of the challenges this year has been a lot of producers out there have gone back and grazed the silage ground, probably grazed it a wee bit later than intended. The game is not up for them in terms of making that high quality silage. Like we've seen some of your work on second cut silage. It can still be made later in the season. Any tips for them? Uh, as I said in one of the slides, the game is not up and you're dead right, Kieran. The important thing is to, fo to, is to follow the principles. When you're closing it for uh, silage production, uh, have it grazed down pretty tight down to about four centimetres if you can do that. Uh, secondly, apply adequate amount of fertiliser, but take into consideration the uh, fertiliser nitrogen that has been applied for the last grazing and assume that approximately a third of that nitrogen is still available. Uh, I'll be targeting approximately 90 units of nitrogen for the first cut at this stage because it will give you flexibility and when you can harvest it. And uh, I will be looking at harvesting that at about six, after a six week growth interval but if it started to shoot and a lot of stem started to come in it, if you haven't too much nitrogen out, you can go that bit earlier. Uh, when harvesting the silage, uh, ideally, if you're baling it, I would try and get a, a target dry matter of about 30%, but 25% is grand as well. And ideally for a clamp, I'd be targeting 25% dry matter because most of the effluent are, is gone. It's all gone at 26, 27, so go up to there if you want to. But if it's too dry, it's more difficult to manage the face next winter to point it feet out, particularly if you're in mild weather. Look, just when you mentioned nature, and money will maybe take the opportunity this summer of growth rate. Well, if certainly if conditions warm up and growth rates improve, to take out some excess products. You know, there's a concern there, Tim, about that nature in it. Any way of mitigating some of that risk with higher nature than some of them products? Depends on the amount of nitrogen you're talking about, Kieran. But look at if you, if it's coming up to where it should be after it, in a three week rotation, and you just let it fall out for an extra week to four weeks, then I don't think there's much of an issue. Uh, particularly if you can bring the dry matter for bales up to about thirty percent. The biggest problem with nitrogen is if you're in siling wet material, and in the past you'd have been direct cutting, direct cutting grass could have been 15, 16, 17 percent dry matter. So that would have been difficult in soil. But if you increase the dry matter up to about thirty percent, you have really in, uh, concentrated the sugars within that material and you've negated most of the negative effects of uh, potential negative effects of nitrogen fertilizer and silage fermentation. 
just when you mentioned that one, just bringing a step forward. Look, oftentimes you'll hear about the time of day having a big impact on the level of sugar and grass. How big of an impact, Tim, do you think has that on silage quality? I don't think it makes any difference. For me, the biggest factor would be I would prefer when I'd be mowing grass, if I could, that the grass is dry because a standing crop, a standing crop will, particularly if it's standing and not, not lodged, will dry out faster than a crop that's more flat on the ground. So in other words, if it's a fine day and the dew is lifted and there's a good wind blowing, you can be going at 10 or 11 o'clock. I definitely wouldn't like to be going at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning with a heavy dew because then it's going to be soaking. And what you're actually doing then is you're mowing grass that could have a dry matter as low as 12%. And if you're low, more, with low dry matter grass to bring that up to, to 30% dry matter, you have a lot more moisture to remove. To bring it to 25% dry matter, you have a lot more moisture to remove than if you're going from 20 to 30. Look at when you mentioned, well, then one of the questions we have in from our attendees, you know, how does hay compare or haylage compare to silage? I think you've touched that a little bit. With the oh, yeah, it's super job like, but uh, hay, haylage is grand if you're putting it in bales, but I would have concern about if it's going into a clamp. So I was talking a lot about clamp silages there tonight. Also, if you are going, if you are going down the haylage route, it's very, very important that you compact the bales. It's very important that you don't bring up any soil contamination and it's extremely important that you put enough wraps on the bales. Uh, if you're talking about wrapping bales of silage, I'd be talking about six wraps for sheep, definitely six wraps. And there's two, there's two ways of doing it. You can use the old system of the net and put on six wraps, or you can use the new system where some people call it the barrel wrap or the, uh, net, the net replacement film. And if you're using net replacement film, you'll get away with four wraps because there's film around the barrel as it is. And it's only the ends that you have to cover and four wraps would more than give you enough overlapping on that. And both systems uh, will be the same price in the contractor and there's benefits to the net replacement film. You mentioned contractor, one of the questions in, we frequently even get it when talking about grass and management. You know, the idea of going in for later cuts, smaller number of bills, particularly for smaller flocks out there, like, is that really, how big of a challenge do you think that is to get contractors to come in for that amount, smaller amounts of silage? Oh, you'll have to talk to your contractor, but if you're a good enough client, I don't think it's an issue. Okay. Look, just one on bills, you know, Contamination is a big risk. Steel is a big risk. Um, we have a question here from John on the spots of isolated grey mould on bales that are wilted for 30 hours. What do you think is the cause and how big of a risk is that? Well, it could be either yeast or it could be a mould, so I'm not 100% sure. It wouldn't be, I, but my preference would be that I wouldn't be feeding that to pregnant joes if I had dry cattle, they'd be getting it. What's the cause of it? Uh, you'd want to be watching that there's no soil contamination. That's a big issue. Uh, you want to be watching if it's the stimmy material, you want to make sure that the bales are very well packed. And the last point is that there's enough of cover or enough of layer of wraps put on them. Look, we chatted about this one before. There's probably a little bit more options with a pit as opposed to bales in terms of trying to avoid um, contamination, particularly the edges of the top or bare preserve silage. Yeah, there's advantages to every system. And I presume the advantage of the pit is that if, particularly if you've got other stock on the farm that you can give the top blocks of silage and the side, side blocks of silage to, we'll say, dry cattle or something, and that the, pit, the blocks in the middle, which will have total anaerobic conditions, there'll be no aerobic conditions whatsoever in them, give them to the sheep and they'll the, be because sheep are more prone to something like listeriosis. Okay. Then we have a question in the chat. It's in relation to what impact red clover would have on silage quality. I suppose we could also ask the question how you levels of white clover and silage, what effect does that have either maybe on preservation or feed value? Well, it's like this, and I, and I don't mean to be smart, that the impact will be, if you cut it at the right stage of growth, you will make good silage with any type of plant that you're putting into the pit. When you go back to the clovers, the use of the clovers will increase the protein content. They are a bit more difficult to ensile, and if you are using them, try and, try and do them in such a way that you will get a wilt, because if you get a wilt, then that will negate an awful lot of the negative other negative factors within them that affects uh, insolubility. Okay. We have a question in here from Sam. It's a TMR type related question. You know, can mixing concentrates of that with some poor quality silage help improve intakes? Well, it will. Yeah, of course it will, because they're going to eat the con it'll increase total dry matter intake, but it'll bring, probably bring down forage intake. I know the work that we did previously with beef cattle would have shown that if you give a small increment of concentrate that you maintain forage intake, but you increase total dry matter intake because of the, uh, because probably of extra protein going into the ration. But with con putting concentrate into a diet where you've got poor quality silage won't have a big negative effect on silage intake anyways because the intake is so low. It will have a negative effect where you've got good quality silage. 
Okay. Look, we have a question in here from Cecil, and we'll perhaps take this one in either way, but the instance of uh, prolapse in sheep on ad lib silage with higher DMD, traditionally, I suppose, we'd have thought about, Tim, maybe at low DMD, fiber stuff. Does that high DMD pose a risk in an ad lib? Oh, that's, a, that's a question that's very hard to answer because traditionally we used to say if you've got hay that you'll probably increase the amount of prolapses. Um, I don't know if, if high DMD silage per se is going, to have a, is going to have an effect on prolapse. And I know a number of farmers that would be using high DMD silage up to 80% DMD. And some years they've got very low levels of prolapse and other years they've been running at about 3%. And these, the flocks I'd be talking about would have high litter sizes. Look, it could even sometimes be simple as feed space. So. Look, and buy a harness. Yeah. Look, you touched on an issue there, then, like probably something that's a wee bit overlooked the level of K that's required in silage swords. So, you take a sheep only scenario, certainly with there's cattle, the cattle story is an ideal way of supplying it. Are we not putting out enough on a lot of sheep only farms or even mixed stock farms? Uh, probably not. No, I, I, look, if they keep their soil indexes right, they need to apply it in the um, adequate amount of K that's going to be removed by the crop. And we clearly put up there tonight that even at a soil index of three, which is the optimum, that if you're putting on, uh, if you're harvesting silage, that each ton of grass dry matter, which is equivalent roughly now to five tons of fresh grass, is taking out 25 kilos of K. The same as a bag of your pottage. And it's probably something else just to keep in mind for anyone who is taking off cuts from paddocks and taking out them bales, yeah. is to actually go back and replenish that as the year progresses. Yeah, because we can all forget to do these things. Indeed. Look, um, I just bring you back from one day, like the chop length with the bales. Look, we see choppers on farms now for feeding it out. You know, balers will depend on the contractor how well it's going to be chopped. Can sheep, can big bale silage possibly punch a little bit higher than its weight because of the fact that it's been chopped going through the machines or the fact that sheep are, you know, the preferential grazers? Will they select out the best leaf if you have good feed management? Oh, of course, yeah. I don't want people to get a hang up on chop length because I just put it up there. It is a factor that affects intake. But go back to where we started. The king. The king is digestibility. And if you get high digestibility, chop length isn't going to make an awful big difference. So once you get digestibility right, that is equivalent to multiples, the effect of chop length per se. Secondly, uh, I know they've choppers on, and, and they're a great job that they, they, they'll compact the bale and, and put more herbage into them. But Remember that a sheep are fantastic at selecting out material. They nearly, they nearly even select out precision chop silage. Don't mind saying big bale silage with a longer chop length. So what you often see is in where silage is being fed in big bales when you go in in the morning, all the leafy material is gone and you're left with the pure stem. So you could argue that the sheep is no fool. They're selecting out the good, they're leaving the bad. And they, even though the silage might would say have an energy concentration of 11 megajoules per kilo of dry matter, that the stuff that they're actually consuming will be higher because they've selected out the leaf material or the high digestibility stuff and left the other stuff behind. So I'm not running down big bill and I think it's a great system. And particularly on a sheep farm where you have small quantities, you can manage it a lot handier. It gives great flexibility to take out paddocks. So if you want to take out, we'll say two paddocks today, or if you had even if you had them close for silage to get high digestibility for the sheep. And if you've got some cows and you want to let that go stim your, you can cut, cut them two weeks later. I think we've gone through most of the questions. Look, obviously, that feed management is probably a discussion for another day, but it has a big impact as well on that silage. Just oh, maybe yeah. a very a very final one on that. Like, you know, how quick do you need to get through the silage? And is there a bit of a difference in how quick some of them bales will go off, depending on when they're caught? And can it live the nature not to was in them? Uh, it's very hard to know how quick, but ideally, uh, if I was on a clamp, a face of a clamp, I'd like to be going across it twice per week. How, how quick is in part? It depends on the prevailing weather conditions. If the, if the temperature is down less than five degrees, uh, it'll stay fresh for a week or two at the face of the pit. If the temperature is up at 12, 13 degrees, uh, it, the air will start to win it and the silage could start to go off. It also depends on what is the digestibility of the silage. High digestibility silage normally will, will be more stable, particularly if it's compacted well, because the air doesn't get back in through it. Whereas when you'd often see very stimmy material that the air can get in through the stem because the stem is a more straw or more stimmy that there's more pores in it and the deer can get back through it and it goes off that bit quicker. So look at if you're using a bale every four or five days, it should be okay. I also think when you're talking about feeding out that the feed barrier in front of the feed barrier should be cleaned twice a week. Okay, Tim, 
I think you've gone through most of the detail. I can let you off the hook at this point for the questions. But Thank thanks you. very much. You cover massive aspects. It obviously has a huge impact on performance, both in sheep systems and cattle systems as well. So it's something really worth spending time on. Look, we're reaching now tonight. Um, I'd like to thank him again for giving up his time. He went through a lot of detail of studies done over the years. I think it's quite comprehensive. This clip will be available to watch back in the coming days. It'll be on the Chagas YouTube channel. We're going to be back joining you in one month's time where we're going to have a virtual open day from one of our better farmers, Shane Moore in County Roscommon. In an ideal world, we'd have loved to go out to Shane's farm and seen some of his progress and seen some of the developments on the farm, but we're going to have to go virtual this time. We're hoping we can include a few clips so you can get a little bit better idea of Shane's system. And that's going to be on the tour to me at 8 o'clock. So again, anyone that has registered, you will get notifications in time. So look, it's just for me, I'd like to thank those that attended tonight, particularly those who have asked questions. Tim, thanks again for your time. And look, we look forward to right. seeing you again in one month's time. Thank you. Thank you.